feels weird to take this off. <laughs> but I think if I keep it on, <laughs> that would be even weirder. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. How are you? How are you in cyberspace? And for those of you online, if you ever want to leap in, and now is a moment where I'm inviting a few words if folks want to share how they're doing. Online, you just, you just start talking. You just unmute yourself and talk, start talking here in the hall. Just a little gusho. How are folks? Struggling. Yeah. Not so good. <laughs> yeah, not so good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm staring out into the apocalypse, right? <laughs> How's that feel? Um, you know, people keep saying, these are unprecedented times. And um, they keep saying that. And I keep feeling like Wally Shawn in uh, The Princess Bride, you know, unprecedented, it's unprecedented. I don't think you know the meaning of that word, <laughs> you know. And um, this past week, right, on top of everything. And, you know, deaths of friends in the middle of all this, right? Deaths of so many people, deaths of so many creatures. And, you know, it's not just, I promise this won't be a completely downer of a talk. <laughs> in fact, that's not my intention. But, um, you know, it's not just that there are big things that are happening. Right? It's that everything that is happening, the traumas that we are individually and collectively experiencing have in a way that feels really new in my life at least, they're all global and systemic. So, you know, it's not just pandemic, which itself is global, right? But a pandemic that reminds us that, you know, if you're black or you're brown, you're twice as likely to get ill. A pandemic that reminds us of the things that are cosmically, not cosmically, uh, institutionally <laughs> broken in our world, right? And, you know, it's not just the murder of, you know, George Floyd, Daniel Prude, Breonna Taylor, all the names and all the ones we don't know the names of, but the ways in which those individual murders are tied into complete systemic long-lasting scars and festering wounds that are at the very center of our country, of the world, of the history of the uh, nations of this world. You know, and it's not just that like things are burning down 20 miles east of here or that smoke is pouring in. It's that, you know, climate disruption, right? I mean, all of this stuff, it's huge, right? And we feel it individually, and the individual feeling is also tied into... Uh, this sense of the universal suffering, right? I mean, this is heavy, folks. Like, if it feels heavy, of course. If you're, I mean, for me, black licorice has been very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're finding yourself amping up those self-care uh, uh, practices, and my goodness, thank the Buddhas and the ancestors for this practice, right? Oh my goodness. So, you know, first noble truth. There is suffering, right? Now, there's no individual subject in that word, in that phrase, as we translate it in English. There is suffering. It, it's, it's universal. Dukkha, suffering, Unsatisf unsatisfactoriness. I feel it in here, and I'm feeling what we all are part of, what we all systemically cosmically, globally share. And then the second noble truth, right? There's a cause. You know that our suffering, this suffering, the suffering, dukkha, it originates in this way that we sentient beings try to hold on or push away, because pushing away is another kind of holding, hold on to that which can't be held. We treat things as if they're 
enduring and solid and singular, and they're not. They're tied into everything else, and we try to hold on, we try to push away, and whence our suffering comes, right? This, this suffering that's all about pushing and pulling, all about pushing and pulling. So third noble truth, nirvana, right? There is cessation, that that flame of craving, of pushing, pulling, the flames of hatred, of claims of desire, that these actually can be extinguished. We can uh, learn, practice how to stop this churning, right? So the fourth noble truth, there's a path, right? There's a path. And, you know, that gets that idea that there's a way that we can work with pushing and pulling. That gets clarified in very precise ways. So many of us are, you know, familiar with the Eightfold Path, you know, those eight aspects of what it would be like to live in a more harmonious, balanced way in these unbalanced times, and all times are unbalanced times, right? You know, so right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. That's sort of the earliest ordering of them. And then in Mahayana Buddhism, the, the, the branch of Buddhism that Zen is a part of, that ordering gets shifted a little bit and the emphasis gets put on a three-part division of thinking about things, the way we can work with morality or ethics, shiva, the way we can work with uh, samadhi, with absorptive, absorb, absorptive, absorbive. What is the word there? Absorbent. Thank you. There is a T in that. Uh, uh, meditation, that sort of breaking uh, through the delusion of self and other, of subject and object. And then prajna, wisdom. Right? The recognition exactly of this global systemic truth of existence that everything is interconnected. The, the truth of emptiness, that emptiness of enduring self-nature. Right? So there's a path. And those distinctions, the eightfold, the three-part division, the, you know, at the base of this, this is just the Buddha's recognition that the path, the way, is the middle way between pushing and pulling. It's the middle way, the middle way. So we can find some equanimity. We can find some balance. This is the comfort of Zazen, right? We can neither lean ne left nor right, forward nor backward. We can find this centered place. We can return to this diamond-ish seat, <laughs> come back to our center, come back to stability again and again, as often as needed, you know, rinse and repeat, <laughs> keep, keep on keeping on. Well, thank goodness for this practice. And also, that's not enough. And that understanding of Buddhism, which I think is the prevailing understanding of Buddhism in, in uh, North America, of this being about centering, being about finding stability, about coming back again and again. Ah, it's beautiful. It's essential. It is the stuff of resilience. But it's not enough, and it's not the full teaching. It leaves out the way this path is also a path of vow, of intention, of movement forward that it's a path of faith. And that's what I kind of want to talk about. I know that it's not enough just to find a center. I mean, not that it's easy. I'm not saying that, like, <sighs> stability is easy. I'm just saying it's not enough, and it's not the full teaching. And I know this to be true. Why do I know this to be true? Because of YouTube, OK? <laughs> and particularly because of. Um, Someone I discovered on YouTube just last week, I mean, this is, you know, I'm very late to the party. I think a lot of you have heard of this 10-year-old uh, Black Britain, uh, Nandi Bushell. Anyone seen this amazing girl? Her father's British, her mother's South African. She's 10 years old. She's a drummer. Oh, my goodness. In fact, like, when I was, I was thinking about talking about Nandi Bushell in this talk, I was like, maybe I should just end the talk and get Stefan to somehow mm -hmm. turn us over to YouTube so we can just, you know, forget about the Dharma, just go into the Dharma of drumming and Nandi. Okay, so this little girl, at the age of four, started, wanted a drum kit, started drumming. 
And um, she's amazing. She, she loves Dave Grohl. She's just like completely into uh, Nirvana, Nirvana, and Foo Fighters, and she's just And when she plays, when she does her covers on YouTube, she just recently uh, challenged Dave Grohl to a drum off, and so that's on YouTube too. It's, a, it's astonishing. When she's, she's been on Ellen, folks. I'm not, you know, if you, <laughs> this, I'm late to this party, but she's 10 years old. When she starts drumming, she screams. She's so full, I mean, she's incredibly talented. She's so full of life, so alive, and she just points. She'll like, Dave Grohl, I challenge you. Checkmate. She'll point with her drumstick, and she'll scream, and she'll, she's burning inside. Such delight, such radiance. And that kind of pointing outward that she does, literally with the drumstick, that sense that she's reaching, 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 reaching. Now, if she's reaching outward, and if the place she's reaching is a place that she thinks is out there or that is out there outside of self, then her wailing away on her drum kit would only increase suffering, would only be about the grasping that creates dukkha, that creates suffering. But her reaching, she's reaching for something out there which is actually already completely inside her, and that's why she brings joy, including Lulu's joy. The cat just wandered into the room, for those of you online. So momentary, momentary astonishment for cat, you know. Coming back to Nandi Bichel. So there's something that gets uh, illuminated when we, I mean, I think this is why we watch, you know, those YouTube videos that then you end up like reposting or send, you know, the stuff on Facebook where you're like, you gotta see this, right? Am I, you guys know what I'm talking, like, am I the only one here who's, you guys are all in masks, so I can't really tell. <laughs> but it's not just that kind of moment of like the release of her evident joy in what she's doing. You know, also, again, kind of late to the party, but um, I was listening to Adele um, to Rolling in the Deep. You guys know that song? She's not a great lyricist. I would not call Adele a great lyricist, but that song, you know, written when she was 21, that her belting it out, we could have had it all. Right? 21 years old, how can you know what it all is? I don't know what it all is, right? And I'm way older enough to be your mother, Adele. But she does know that it all. She knows that all, just like Nandy, 10-year-old Nandy. Inside her is the radiance of a thousand suns, right? Same with Adele in that expression of heartbreak. So it's not just about joy, taking joy and delight in, in the gift that you know, the universe gave you. It's also those moments where the heart is broken. Um, and I've talked about this before, um, I think. Um, the way in which these expressions of joy and heartbreak reveal this golden radiance, this infinite radiance already inside us. Right? So you all, many of you have probably heard the story of the Golden Buddha in Thailand. Um, speaking of infinite golden radiance. So you go to the temple of the Golden Buddha in Thailand, and there's a 10-foot golden Buddha, I mean, actual gold. The, the hair and top knot is like 99% pure gold. The body is like 80% gold. This is 10 feet tall, weighs 6,000 tons. And I had to look like this, like, what is 6,000 tons? Picture a really full UPS truck, OK, filled with Amazon stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is 6,000 tons. This is the size of this Buddha. They think it was probably um, fashioned in the 1200s or 1300s, uh, and that at some point, probably around the mid-18th century, the temple that it was in at that time uh, was under uh, threat of invasion by Burmese invaders, and that the decision was made. Does this story sound familiar? I mean, this sounds like a parable, but this is actually a whole bunch of this is, I mean, this is history, right? Um, the Buddha was covered with stucco and plaster in order to keep it safe, keep it under, uh, under wraps. 
And in fact, it remained in that temple uh, until I think it was first moved in 1935. This stuck, you know, oh, it's a really big concrete Buddha. Okay, move it to a new. In 1955, uh, at that point, it was already in the temple that it's now in. They were moving it into another hall, onto another pedestal, and it was 6,000 tons. They dropped it, and the plaster chipped away. And they're like, there's gold there. There's a golden Buddha. You know, it was protected, it was very safe. There was a golden Buddha underneath. And as they chipped away the plaster, the entire radiance of the Buddha uh, could be seen. Um, it turns out that there's actually was a key and you can sort of unlock the key and you can break it down into parts so it's easier to move so it won't break again. But that was covered up too. The key to safely moving the golden Buddha was covered up by the concrete. And you can go to Bangkok and you can see this Buddha and you can also see in a display case, you can see the plaster, some of the plaster that they removed uh, in 1955. So, you know, this story gets told. It's all over the internet. So when I was trying to, you know, sort of fact check it, it's like, you know, there's, it's everywhere because it's such a good parable, right? Such a beautiful parable. The golden radiance is there all along. We just didn't know it, right? The radiance of our Buddha nature, right? And it becomes, you know, a kind of concrete <laughs> or golden example of uh, this truth of universal liberation. You know, this is, this is what uh, the Lotus Sutra teaches again and again, that, you know, we're all actually already liberated. We're all already golden Buddhas. We just haven't realized it yet. We haven't realized it in the sense that Ejo was using last week. We haven't realized it like recognized it, but we also haven't made it real, our golden nature. We haven't made that real either. So in the Lotus Sutra, Shariputra, who is you know, the most excellent in wisdom of the Buddha's disciples, he's kind of the spokesperson for asking this question in front of this assembly that's like you know, countless beings, not just from our world, but like celestial you know, realms, Buddha realms, like all, like all of, uh, I was going to say creation, but even beyond that. Like, all sentient beings in front of this assembly, Shariputra is sort of the spokesperson, and he asks the question to the Buddha. He's like, you know, you've, you've taught us the way, but is that the same thing as the truth? Like, what's the real teaching underneath the stuff you've taught us? And the Buddha's like, mm, okay. I mean, the Lotus Sutra, in many, many different ways, as, as I read it, the Buddha's basically saying, there's not a difference between the way <laughs> and the Dharma. The journey already is the destination. We're already there. We're already there. Uh, so there's this line of all those who hear the Dharma, the Buddha says, none will fail to become Buddhas. We're all already Buddhas. Now there's a wait, of all those who hear the Dharma, but will we all hear the Dharma as the, the Buddha describes it? Um, uh, as the Buddha describes it, there's no way not to hear the Dharma because the Dharma is preached, is expounded in innumerable countless ways. For countless ages in the past, innumerable Buddhas have passed into extinction. Hundreds of thousands of billions of kinds of Buddhas. Their number beyond calculation. Everywhere you look, there are Buddhas. All the way back all the way forward. Some paint Buddha images of many colors and adorn them with a hundred signs of good fortune, whether done by themselves or by employing others. All have fulfilled the Buddha way. Even if little children at play, this is the Buddha speaking, answering Shariputra's question, like, well, you know, the way you've taught us, is, that the, is there a difference between that and what it leads to, the truth? says, even if little children at play use reeds, sticks, or brushes, all these different ways of expressing ourselves, of expressing our understanding, even if they use reeds, sticks, or brushes, these little children, or even their fingernails to draw images of Buddha, all such people gradually gaining merit and developing their great compassion have fulfilled the Buddha way. 
There are those who worship by prostrating themselves, some merely by putting their palms together, others only by raising a hand, and others by a slight nod of the head. All of these, honoring images in various ways, will progressively see countless Buddhas fulfill the unexcelled way themselves, save countless beings everywhere, and enter into nirvana without residue as a fire dies out, as a fire dies out, when the firewood is all consumed. Of all those who hear the Dharma, none will fail to become a Buddha. What isn't a way to hear the Dharma and what isn't a path to the Buddha way? 10 out of 10 will be liberated. Of all those who hear the Dharma, none will fail to become a Buddha. You know, incidentally, when you see the Golden Buddha in Bangkok, in the Temple of the Golden Buddha. Uh, the Buddha's in that characteristic posture, the uh, Maravijaya pasta, pa- pasta, posture, I think it's called. Um, the uh, victory over Mara, over the uh, Lord of Delusion. Uh, that posture is, recalls the Buddha uh, uh, being asked by Mara, you know, by what right? do you have to claim uh, this seat, this seat uh, of the way, of the path toward enlightenment? And the Buddha touches his hand to the ground. The earth is my witness, right? We're completely connected by the earth. And then in the moment of the Buddha's awakening, we're told, he says, I, together with all beings in the great earth, simultaneously achieve the way. We're all already awakened because there's no separation here. This is our earth. This is us. So liberation, like suffering, is universal. No separation. And yet, you know, I got to bring us back to, uh, to Nandi and to, uh, and to Adele. Sometimes where I end up going in these talks, it's like, I don't know. Um, So that vision of the golden radiance in us already, of us already being Buddhas, that vision, that understanding that there's not the way and where the way leads to, right? Dogen will call this uh, what I'm saying, he'll call this, our, our 13th century ancestor in this, in this lineage of Soto Zen, will call this practice realization. It's not like you practice in order to become enlightened. Right? The way is the Dharma, is the path toward awakening, is awakening. Um, this vision of how liberation is universal, just like dukkha being universal, uh, it's a, it's a nice story, but it's not quite specific enough, right? Uh, it doesn't, I can't, I don't know how to metabolize that. So that's why I bring up Nandi and Adele, in order to metabolize, do you know what I mean? In order to really digest, to feel in my own, even though they're not, uh, not mine from an absolute sense, but I have to feel in my own bones the truth of my golden radiance. I have to come back to these specific examples. Now, you know, Nandi, at the age of four, uh, listened to the Beatles with her parents as they were making pancakes, okay? And she got really into the Beatles, but she especially, for some reason, got into Ringo Starr. I don't know why. (laughs) She was telling this story to Ellen, and Ellen was like, "Mm mm-hmm, Ringo, (laughs) Mm mm-hmm, Ringo, okay. Um, But that Ringo, and I guess she saw a picture of a drum kit, that got her. She's like, oh. That was, that was the moment for her. Adele, there was apparently someone named Slinky Winfield who broke her heart. Um, so Ringo and Slinky, <laughs> these were the moments for, uh, for Nandy and Adele. Um, the author Alan Cohen, in a, in a, uh, it's actually a really, um, really, it's a little schmaltzy, but a quite lovely film. Um, uh, about um, um, Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. I'm going to talk a little bit about the hero's journey next week, but this film is called Finding Joe. You can find it on Netflix, by the way, but 
Alan Cohen, he, he recounts the Golden Buddha story, and he says about that story, he says, you know, something comes along at one point, something comes along that cracks our casing and knocks off a piece of our armor, armor. And in that moment, we look inside and see the gold. At that moment, all we want to do for the rest of our life is pick away the stone because the gold is so much more fun. And that seems totally spot on to me, that there are these moments that crack something open. Ringo Starr for Nandi Bichel. Getting your heart stomped on at the age of 21, your first great love, cracks something open where you then see this golden radiance. That moment of cracking that, you know, I think here too of Nandi, that makes you point, that makes you go, yes, it's out there, there's something out there. You're feeling the something in here. But it feels out there, it makes Adele say, we could have had it all. Right? It's out there. But it's what's been cracked open in here. Right? Now, Joseph Campbell is also famous for saying this phrase that has driven me crazy for a long time. Um, he says, follow your bliss. You guys have heard that? Seen the, seen the bumper stickers, maybe? Mm -hmm. So one way of thinking about this that comes from the same source of that film I was talking about that's about Joseph Campbell, the, sort of, and we'll talk more about this next week, The Hero's Journey. One way of thinking about this is follow your bliss. Do the thing that ignites your passion. Follow that. When you look at Nandi, you can say, oh yeah, she's, you know, there's bliss there. In my experience, it doesn't feel like bliss a lot of the time. So I would say follow the crack, those moments where <sighs> something's cracked, something's been revealed, the facade <sighs> has chipped away just enough for there to be a glimpse of that radiance underneath that was always there. So I've talked about this before, I think, in this hall, but you know, for me, the moment of falling in love with my husband, and similarly the moment of falling in love with the Dharma, a period when I first started actually practicing here, not in this exact hall, <laughs> it was more like a, well, more like a garage. Um, and what I felt at the time, uh, have you ever uh, gotten slight frostbite in your fingers? when they're really cold and really numb, and then you run them under warm water. And that pain, which you also know is the blood coming back, that's what those moments of falling have felt like. That crack. Didn't understand it. Either falling in love with the Dharma, falling in love with my beloved, didn't understand what was happening to me, sort of had words for it, didn't understand it, couldn't put a frame around it. Follow the crack. It's infallible in my experience when we allow ourselves to follow those moments that feel, sometimes feel like our heart is breaking, sometimes feel like we're exploding with inspiration, sometimes just feel like, oh, that's a really good cup of coffee. Something eases. Doesn't, I'm a dramatic person, I'm like all over the place, so for me it's like, ah! But sometimes it just feels like, like a little, a little opening. Follow that. It's infallible, it's infallible. Um, in a way this is me saying, lean into the dukkha, lean into the suffering. Now, finding a way to do that skillfully is, requires all the stuff I was talking about at the beginning of this talk when I was saying, you know, the Four Noble Truths are awesome. They're not enough. <laughs> Leaning in requires all of that. But without that leaning in, how do we find the path? So all of this is, for me, kind of prelude to trying to talk about... Uh, 
discernment. Discernment is a word that um, in Christian circles gets used all the time. I'm a chaplain, so work in an interfaith environment. So I'm really familiar with the word discernment in that spiritual sense. And when people in a Christian context, and mostly Christian, and I, I don't think it's as, as big in, in the other monotheistic religions, mostly when they're talking about discernment, what they're talking about is you know, kind of finding the movement of the spirit in your life. And by the spirit, they mean God. Right? So there's a God-centered idea in it. But more broadly, the notion of discernment, of spiritual discernment, is just about following the crack. Like, where, is, where does that lead? Going down that rabbit hole in skillful ways. Leaning in. So um, we're about to embark, uh, the temple's about to embark on this sort of new format of having these community circles, um, small gatherings for people to, uh, in a non-hierarchical way, sort of explore the Dharma, explore practice in real time. So I'm doing a community circle on vow and discernment and wanted to talk a little bit with you guys about discernment. So that's what I'm doing right now. Next week I'll talk a little bit more about this and talk about how this connects into whatever vow is, whatever it means to set our intentions, whatever it means to point towards something out there which actually has to already be in here. <laughs> for that gesture to do anything other than increase suffering. So what is that? That's what I want to talk about a little bit next week and then work with whoever wants to join along um, in exploring the movement of the Buddha way in our lives. But today I wanted to close with um, a little story. Um, which I hope doesn't seem too much like a tangent. I hope it makes sense how it connects up with hmm, what I've been sharing so far and with this general topic of vow and discernment. It's a story from the Jataka Tales. So the Jataka Tales were written, they're, they're basically stories about uh, the Buddha before he was a Buddha, like the countless lifetimes of the Buddha when he was not the Buddha. Um, and, uh, and they're sort of morality tales, folk tales. They're written down in the 4th and 5th century. And there's a Zen practitioner, actually, Echo kind of turned me on to him, um, called Rafe Martin, who's spent his whole, basically, Dharma career retelling those stories and mining these very traditional stories about the Buddha's past lives um, uh, for kind of nuggets of, of wisdom. Um, so there's one of these Jataka tales that's about the Bodhisattva, the, the pre-Buddha, in an uh, earlier life when he was a little parrot, a gray parrot. So he's a little parrot uh, in a great green forest. And one day the parrot's flying around, and actually I'm going to change the gender. The parrot's flying around and she's uh, noticing that the forest's on fire. There's smoke billowing everywhere. The forest is burning down. And her heart just constricts. And so she calls out as she's flapping her way toward freedom. She calls out to all the woodland creatures. She says, everybody, run, run, run. There's fire. I can see it everywhere. Run. But she realizes that pretty much all the creatures are trapped in the burning forest. And she starts flying. She's like, I don't know what to do. She's flying, flying. She flies toward water, toward the river. And at the river, she finds a bunch of creatures who have found some relative safety. And she says to them, oh, you guys, come, help me. Let's gather water from the river. And if we all carry a little bit of water, we can, we can maybe make a dent in these flames. And they're like, what are you talking about? We can't. This whole forest, 150,000 acres, it's burning down. We can't actually end this fire. She's like, come on, come on, come on. And they're like, no, we're safe here. So the little brave parrot uh, in her little parrot wings, picks up a little water and flies it over, drops it on part of the forest burning. She's realizing that the trees, the trees that have sheltered her, those trees are sentient beings too that are dying. She drops a little water on them. Psst, you know, it's like a thimble full of water. She keeps doing it, she keeps doing it. She starts to get singed and burned, but she keeps flying, she keeps flying. The celestial beings in the celestial realms are watching her throughout this. And they're like, gosh, 
<laughs> Look at that. They're basically like the creatures in the forest. They're saying, you know, what, what craziness. This, this old parrot's not going to be able to, to stop these flames. They're, they're just laughing at her, essentially. Or being a little bit, oh, poor parrot. Poor parrot. You know, she doesn't know what she's doing. There's one of the gods, one of the celestial beings, who does sort of sees what she's doing and is kind of overwhelmed with uh, sadness, admiration. He turns himself into a great big eagle, an eagle who's big enough that he can squeeze the clouds together. And he squeeze the, squeezes the clouds together, and out comes rain, and enough rain to end the fire. So that's the story of the brave little parrot. You know, what does that mean for us now? To me, Rafe Martin kind of, he, he, he makes the story a little bit nicer. He's like, and then the, the eagle uh, showers the, magically showers the parrot with magic that turns all her feathers to brilliant colors, and now she's a beautiful, resplendent, but that's not in the original tale. She's just a, a charred gray parrot at the end of the original tale. But what is this a story about? The, the crack, right? Like right now, like how do we make sense of this? And the only real answer is just to find a way to really be with the heartbreak. And then to flap our wings in whatever way comes to mind. Because the forest is always burning, right? But we really see it now. Okay. I feel like I should end with <laughs> some kind of drum riff. But we, we do have time for, for questions or comments. You guys hanging on? Mm, trying to. <laughs> yeah. So how is that? How is that working for you? Mm. I guess it's the. Um, what else can I do? <laughs> yeah. I do what I can do. Yeah. Yeah. I can't get rid of the smoke. I, w I would if I could. Yeah. So I just go do my things in the smoke. Yeah. And go do our things in the smoke. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, um, and does this idea resonate at all? The idea of following that crack? Yeah, mm -hmm. Genjo. Trungpa uh, Rinpoche, I think, has a similar saying, just talking about this. He says, a bodhisattva should always have a small open wound. Hmm. And that might actually not have been Trump or Rinpoche. Someone told Somebody. Me. So, anywho, that's a nice sentiment. I think it's pointing to what you're saying yeah. and how, for me, that also feels very true. Yeah. And how, in your experience, there can be times where I'll pick up my pain and grab it and want to play with it. And, like, uh, even it can be like, I want to understand it, I want to know it, I want mm -hmm. to, like, use it and start kind of mentating. Mm -hmm. on that, that crack that it feels like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, how have you managed to um, keep that, uh, that open wound connective and alive and um, not just trying to find a band-aid for it or, um, you know, look inside and be like, what is blood? Like, you know, all these <laughs> weird ways we can go with the pain in our life, which we do all the time. Um, yeah, if you could speak to that, yeah. I'd be curious what you experience. I don't worry as much as I once did about making stories about the pain. I don't, it, there certainly are lots of ways that um, exploring the ache and the owie can just be about a game and reinforcing a dramatic sense of ego and I am this person who has this pain. I don't worry so much about that because Instead, you know, I mean, take this week, 
you know? So for me, this week was in part about watching Nandi Bichelle videos. Like, oh my God, there's such aliveness there. So in the middle of the ow, the wound, finding what, what feels so alive, what's infallible in these moments of heartbreak, but also in the moments of great joy or little joy, is that aliveness. When we connect with that, we start to connect with that which in our own life is moving, is always, it's always been in movement, but now we can start to see how that motion works. We can start to see the, the creative core of this being and how that creative core is interconnected with all of the other cores out there. So in some ways, you know, what is it that finding the things that, that keep you going, you know, as you're saying, like, keep on doing, you know, finding the things that keep you going in times of woundedness is precisely the way in which the wound stays open but becomes a path forward. I don't know if that satisfies Genjo. Totally satisfies. Totally. totally. Just nailed that. Wound nailed that. <laughs> no, no, keep the wound open. Keep the wound open. Thank you for your teaching. You know, can you hear me? Mm hmm. Hey, Reiko. Hi. I just, um, I just wanted to thank you um, and express gratitude for reminding me about the story. Uh, about the forest fire mm -hmm. right now, um, especially. The, the versions that I've read are actually a hummingbird mm. um, and not a parrot, and the hummingbird uh, picks up the water in her beak. Mm. And so, just mm. like profoundly infinitesimal, mm, infinitesimally small, right? And um, I, I can't wait to go mine the crack of that story and find uh, how many versions I can read to my kids right now. Because just um, and 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 really in the existential crisis, mm -hmm. we're we're all feeling um, the fact that we can we can do something that matters. Yeah. And um, as a parent. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm digging so deep right now how mm. to live through this and teach through this that what we do matters. Mm. Um, and I'm seeing, I, I'm seeing this in our, in our kids and in our young people. Like, what does it matter? It doesn't matter what we do. And, and to try to teach into that. Um, to be reminded of stories, to teach into that is just invaluable. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. The way it matters what we do, right? the way it matters is not because we will carry enough water to put out the flame, or that somehow our actions will inspire an eagle god to drop more water. The way it matters is because what's alive in here is the Buddha, is awakening. We each carry awakening in us. We each are in our crazy neurotic messiness. Well, I'll just speak for myself. Mm -hmm. We each are in all the stuff we think about as who we are. We are actually protecting <laughs> the golden radiance of the Buddha. We're carrying awakening in us. Uh, you know, as someone who has been connected deeply to uh, monotheistic traditions, to Judaism and Christianity, I'm always struck by the difference between um, traditions where there is a revealed word of God and our tradition, where we, we're, we're, we, are, the, we are the Dharma. <laughs> we are. Each of us. Right? So... 
the way it matters is not because this little myobin shaped entity is going to end the fire, but because this little myobin shaped entity, if she remembers, is actually a golden Buddha, as we all are. I wonder if I might say something. Please. Uh, uh, I, I like to remind myself a lot in situations where I don't really have a lot of control and sometimes there's stuff you can do and sometimes there's not. Um, but I remember the Dalai Lama saying something along the lines of, uh, on worry, if there's something you can do, do it. And if there's nothing you can do, what's the point of worrying? Hmm. Uh, but I also just was reading a, a book by, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Pema Chodron. Yeah, Pema Chodron. Um, she said, um, we need to develop an appetite for groundlessness. We need yes. to get curious about it and be willing to pause and hang out for a while mm -hmm. in that space of insecurity. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, that's that's very well supported by, by psychology and some therapeutic practices mm -hmm. um, to help overcome your fear, um, kind of facing your fear, or, or in the leap, just sitting and reminding yourself, I'm okay. I'm not dying. I'm anxious that I've been through worse. I like the comparisons that the Dalai Lama talked about. Um, you've been through worse. You can definitely get through this. Um, and so I just wanted to share those quotes because they yes. uh, were meaningful for me. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finding a way to, I mean, you know, this is a path of resilience and these times are are testing our ability to find that resilient uh, home uh, that is not a home, that is infinitely mobile. <laughs> Making our peace with groundlessness, that's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. I, I live in the forest. And I've lived in the forest most of my life. And so it is not an abstract experience I'm having. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's been heart-wrenching for me. But also, I think, uh, as you were saying, a way to connect, knowing that forests are always burning and have always been burning. And that doesn't mean we, can't, we, <clears throat> we don't have to tend to them. But to connect with the the universal experience of all beings. And it struck me this week that bodhisattvas are born in hell and that they return there. And I think that for me, it's easy for all of us to see the smoke everywhere, but in another way, the smoke is always there. And if we connect with that golden Buddha as you so well said to me, it was so clear to me, that the voices are all around us constantly uh, speaking of their suffering. So I, I felt that your story was uh, very clear and uh, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for its wisdom. Are you safe now? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is, um, you know, there's always the specificity of what's universal. So the individual experiences of loss and suffering. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to add something. If you can hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, I was at uh, Springfield High School, the evacuation center, a couple times. Um, and I noticed that a lot of people had that thousand yard stare <laughs> of um, trauma. And, you know, even though they weren't, they were kind of centered and focused in the moment, but I think in the coming 
days and weeks that's going to come home to roost for them and a lot of them are still probably going to be here in the eugene springfield area if they don't have anywhere else to go so this is really an opportunity for all of us to take our practice of loving kindness and patience to the next level because we don't know who's an evacuee and who's not and what they may have been through and i think it's just um really important that we bear we all bear that in mind that now especially we don't know what kind of wars people have fought maybe in the very recent past yeah yeah thank you and finding ways to meet that thousand yard stare with as much directness and presence as can be mustered <sighs> so just love on up all the people around you in you know socially distanced ways as needed mm-hmm. but yeah mm-hmm.